China has claimed that it is a near arctic state. Now just consider this for a moment. China claims this despite the shortest distance between Beijing and the Arctic being around 5000 kilometers. That's like saying that Afghanistan borders the South China Sea. Even Saudi Arabia, which is a dry desert country, is investing heavily in the Arctic region. Countries that border the Arctic Circle, like the US and Russia, are renewing their claims in the region. So why is there a sudden rush to exploit the Arctic? And at what cost? Well, to put it simply, the answer is climate change. Warming temperatures in the Arctic are leading to massive investment opportunities. Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane, when released into the atmosphere, trap excess heat and warms the planet. This global warming has led to a rapid temperature rise, which in turn is causing Arctic sea ice to melt at levels we have never seen before. Permafrost, which is the soil that has been frozen for more than two years, is thawing at an alarming rate. The melting ice and the thawing permafrost are opening up new shipping lanes and making it easier to perform activities like drilling, surveying and exploration. In simple terms, a warming arctic is good for business. Many industries are opening up and there has been no shortage in the number of investors. Now this is exactly where political tensions are bound to happen. Claims for arctic territory are complicated. More economic activity will lead to more claims in the region, which would lead to an increase in military presence, thereby increasing the chance for conflict to break out. This is beyond borders, and in this video, we will look into the complicated geopolitics of the Arctic Circle, especially in a time of extreme global warming. According to NASA, Arctic sea ice levels have been declining since 1979 and is expected to decrease further. The Arctic sea ice minimum, which is the day in a given year when sea ice reaches its smallest extent, usually at the end of summer, which is around September. In recent years, September Arctic sea ice has been declining at an alarming rate of 13.1% per decade. These figures are important considering the fact that the Arctic connects 90% of the world's economy and accounts for 15% of land on Earth. It sits on vast amounts of untapped resources, which includes 15% of the world's remaining oil, 30% of world's natural gas, and 20% of its LNG deposits. Greenland alone holds about 10% of the world's freshwater reserves. The melting of Arctic sea ice to record lows in recent years has prompted many nations, principally those with Arctic Ocean coastlines, to re-evaluate their Arctic strategy. They are led by the likes of US, Canada, Russia, Norway, and Denmark, which includes Greenland. Non-Arctic countries like China, India and Saudi Arabia have also expressed interest in the Arctic. The energy sector and the shipping industry are set to take over the Arctic. The US Geological Survey estimates that undiscovered oil and gas reserves in the Arctic are more than 400 billion barrels. Drilling through the Arctic ice has always been a difficult prospect, and that is why the Arctic was never used to its full potential. But now, Global warming due to climate change is causing rapid ice melt and heating the waters at an exponential pace. This is expected to make activities like drilling and mineral exploration easier. As Arctic ice melts, it opens new shipping routes. Also, existing routes will be easier to traverse, more so in the summer season. Commercial ships would prefer Arctic lanes over established routes because it offers shorter trade routes, saving time, fuel and energy. But a harsh climate and frozen waters have made it difficult to navigate. However, this is changing as a result of warmer temperatures. Currently, there are three main shipping routes in the Arctic. The Northeast Passage, the Northwest Passage and the Transpolar Sea Route. Commercial ships require the assistance of icebreakers to navigate through these routes. An icebreaker is a specially designed ship 
that can travel through icy waters without damaging the ship's hull. However, the need for icebreakers is expected to become less relevant in the future. In 2009, the Beluga Group became the first western shipping company to navigate the northern sea route without icebreaker assistance. In 2007, the Northwest Passage was opened for navigation without icebreaker support. It is also expected that the transpolar route will be fully navigable by 2030. This can be seen in the number of cargo ships transiting the region. In 2009, only five ships transited the Northern Sea route, while in 2013, 71 cargo ships had passed through the route. New routes are also said to emerge in the future as a result of sea ice loss. This is exactly where political tensions are bound to happen. Claims for Arctic territory are complicated. More economic activity will lead to more claims in the region, which would lead to an increase in military presence, thereby increasing the chance for conflict to break out. It is important to note that there is no legally binding treaty governing the Arctic, unlike Antarctica, which is governed by the legally binding Antarctic Treaty. The UN Law of the Sea Convention helps establish a foundation in the Arctic and the Arctic Council acts as a forum for discussion among stakeholders. However, decisions on the Arctic are made by mutual agreement and not on legal doctrines. It can be argued that Russia dominates the Arctic. Out of the 4 million Arctic population, 2 million people live in Russia and its coastline accounts for 53% of the Arctic. Hence, Russia frequently flexes its military might in the Arctic. This has raised concerns among many nations, especially in the West, where a Russian ice curtain is descending over the Arctic. In 2007, in an expedition called Arctica, Russia used submersibles to plant the Russian flag on the Arctic seabed of the Lomonosov Ridge. It is an area which is claimed by Canada, Denmark and Russia. The expedition was a strategic move to assert ownership of the ridge. The move had raised concerns in the US and Canada, but they were dismissed when Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov claimed that it was a scientific expedition and it was no different from the US planting the flag on the moon. Perhaps Russia's dominance in the region is reflected in the fact that no other country other than Russia operates nuclear-powered icebreakers. Russia has nine nuclear-powered icebreakers and plans to conduct three more in the future. Russia is also uncompromising when it comes to maintaining a strong military presence in the region. The Russian Northern Fleet, which is the largest of the four Russian naval fleets, has its headquarters in Severomorsk on the Barents Sea. In an impressive display of Kremlin's military might, the Northern Fleet includes more than around 80 operational ships. 30 submarines and a nuclear-powered missile cruiser among others. It also has a specially trained unit for Arctic combat and Russia has plans to increase troop presence. Russian economic activity in the Arctic is progressing at a rapid pace. Its role in maritime transport is crucial as Russian icebreakers prove to be of commercial value as they assist and guide civilian ships to navigate through the harsh Arctic waters. Russian oil companies like Gazprom and Rosneft have a significant presence in the region. Companies like ExxonMobil and Chevron are in deals with Russian companies for joint development of the Arctic. Russia is also the only country which has a floating nuclear power plant. Russia's impressive display has rattled a lot of nerves in the West, especially the US. When the US purchased Alaska from the Russian Empire in 1867, it became a stakeholder in the Arctic. Now, a country has to file a claim for an extended continental shelf which has to be accepted by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in order to be officially recognized. The US has not ratified the Law of the Sea as of yet and it has made statements along with other Western countries that many parts of the Arctic are part of open waters. This is in response to Russia's increasing claims of territory within the Arctic. Traditionally, the US has taken a relaxed approach to the Arctic. However, 
U.S. approach has shifted gears in the wake of global warming and aggressive Russian policies. U.S. conducts regular ice exercises in the Arctic in order to affirm its stake in the region. In 2009, the U.S. Navy attack submarine, the USS Annapolis, made headlines when it surfaced from three feet of Arctic ice. China, which had been kept out of economic activity for much of the 19th and 20th centuries, would be missing a great opportunity if it didn't stake a claim in the Arctic. The problem is that China has no border with the Arctic and it cannot make territorial claims legally. But this hasn't deterred the Chinese. In 2018, China released a white paper claiming that it was a mere Arctic state and that it aimed to become a major stakeholder in the coming years. A Chinese general claimed that no nation has sovereignty over the Arctic. This is despite the fact that China claims the entire South China Sea as its historic property and has denied claims of other nations over the South China Sea. China has made plans for a polar silk road, which is a major part of its flagship Belt and Road Initiative. Through the polar silk road strategy, China aims to lay a solid vision for its long-term plan in the Arctic. The energy resources, short transport routes, and economic potential make the Arctic an ideal place for China to invest in. China's Arctic strategy hinges on two very important strategic goals. Firstly, China aims to invest in countries having an immediate stake in the Arctic. For example, China has signed a free trade agreement with Iceland and has built its embassy in Iceland's capital, Reykjavik, which, by the way, is the largest embassy in Reykjavik. China has a 30% stake in the Russia-China Yamal LNG project in the Arctic. It is also one of the largest LNG projects in the world. It has also promised to invest $5 billion in the Payaka oil field in Russia. International sanctions of Russia over the Ukraine crisis forced Russia to seek Chinese financial help in developing Arctic infrastructure. China has research facilities specifically focused on the Arctic, set up in Finland and Iceland. China also has a research institute in the Svalbard archipelago of Norway. The second strategy is a lobbying effort by China, using these investments to become part of global dialogues in the Arctic. China is now a permanent observer member in the Arctic Council, which means it can be a part of all dialogues and discussions taking place within the Council. China has also built an icebreaker which traversed the entire Northeast Passage in 2012. India, on the other hand, has a completely different approach when it comes to the Arctic. India recently released a draft Arctic policy outlining what it hopes to achieve in the Arctic. However, unlike the Chinese strategy of aggressively asserting itself, India has followed a more scientific and research-oriented approach rather than an overt military strategy. It is more on the lines of the impact of global warming in the Arctic and how it will affect India in the coming years. The policy proposes to understand conditions in the Arctic so that it can be harmonized with Himalayan research, monsoon patterns, water security, disaster management, and space research. Even though the Arctic policy is new, India has had a long relation with the Arctic. India signed the Svalbard Treaty, which recognizes Norway's sovereignty over the Svalbard archipelago in 1920. India sent its first expedition to the Arctic in 2007. India also established a research station called Himadri in 2008 at Svalbard and deployed an observatory called Indar. India's Arctic policy can also be seen as a response to China's increasing presence in the region. India currently has an observer status in the Arctic Council. India has also expressed interest in mineral exploration. The draft policy recommends sustainable exploration of minerals with a greater focus on renewable energy. The policy also expresses India's interest in becoming a stakeholder in the Arctic Sea Rules. Sadly, the geopolitical drama in the Arctic comes at the cost of neglecting the environment. Intense warming threatens the flora, fauna and indigenous peoples of the Arctic. A melting permafrost 
would release enormous amounts of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. By the way, methane is 23 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Melting ice would lead to a rise in sea levels and will also affect ocean currents which will lead to a change in global weather conditions. It could also intensify extreme weather related incidents like hurricanes, heat waves and forest fires. Rising sea levels could also affect small island nations like Sri Lanka and lead to coastal erosion. Warming waters would lead to destruction of the marine and terrestrial population of which many species are already facing extinction. Oil and gas exploration increases the chances of oil spills which would pollute and damage the Arctic beyond repair. Hence, it is absolutely important that we think about solutions and strategies that would help mitigate the coming Arctic crisis. So, what do you think about all of this? Are geopolitical rivalries more important than combating climate change and preserving the region? Can sovereign concerns be reconciled with environmental concerns? Do share your thoughts in the comments. I would love to see them. I hope you like this video. If so, please do like, share and subscribe.